Hey guys, this is Brian with Inspiring How You See That, and today we have a very special guest. We have Ken Schnocki, who is the President and General Manager of the Columbus Clippers. And Ken, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Happy to do it. Thank you. And how long have you been President and General Manager? Well, I took over in 89 as General Manager, uh, but this is my 45th year with the Clippers. So oh, wow. I, I always tell people I started when I was two years old. There you go. So I'm actually <laughs> the last of the originals. I was hired in November of 1976 as we were getting ready to open what was then Franklin County Stadium. Okay. And then, you know, we were there 32 years before we built and moved downtown in the Arena District into Huntington Park. Nice. And this is a beautiful park. Thank you. It's, it's been about a decade you've been here, correct? This is the 13th season. Okay. Yeah. Of course, we didn't play last year, as no one did. But, uh, yeah, it's still it's still a beautiful ballpark. It still gets a lot of awards. Uh, we're very proud of it and work our darndest to maintain it and keep it nice and fresh. Nice. So if you ever come to Columbus, make sure you come to a game here. This place is outstanding. It's absolutely beautiful and a great place to see a game. And we tried, as we built this, the, the thought process was we wanted to build an outdoor park where baseball's played. Okay. And we wanted to incorporate some of the iconic features uh, that are noticed in Major League Baseball. So on the right field line, we have our own mini green monster. It's 22 feet tall, where the big one in Boston is 37 feet tall. Nice. There's big screens and, and holes in that fence where you can see from the outside, and that's reminiscent of oversized knot holes back in the 40s and 50s. You sure. see all those pictures of kids looking through knot holes <laughs> in wooden fences. And then on the right field side, we have our scoreboard, uh, and underneath it, you can stand and look in from the outside. That, that idea was taken from what's now Oracle Park in San Francisco, used to be AT&T Ballpark. Our hitting backdrop raises and lowers. I mean, the fans always see it up when the Clippers are at home. Sure. We'll lower it when we go on road trips, so you have great views into the ballpark from the intersection outside. And there's only two of these in the country. The other one that raises and lowers is Staten Island for the New York City skyline. Okay. And then in left field, we have our tribute to Camden Yards, our, our brick building. And on top of that, on the third floor, we have some outdoor bleachers. So you can feel like you're sitting on the rooftops of Wrigley. So nice. uh, we tried to, to really incorporate some neat features so we could remember a lot of the great baseball history. Sure. And of course, baseball, of all the major sports, is really steeped in history. So I like how you're taking the new, the 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 flashy, the beautiful, and mixing with everything that made baseball really American. Yeah, well, we are trying to do that. I mean, all the signs for the section signs uh, are in black and white, and they feature pic uh, pic pictures of former Columbus players that have played here that go back to the 1930s or so and get as current as you know, Derek Jeter and some of the Yankee guys from our 28 years with the Yankees. We don't have any of our Indians up yet. Uh, some, most of them are still playing. Sure. Before you start putting pictures of them up, you want to make sure they, they finish a <laughs> solid career. So we do all the baseball history around the ballpark in black and white. And then when we introduce and, and fill sponsors in, we put all their logos in color. So you've kind of got a, a pop and sure. a variance between the two. So it makes for a very subtle but very classy approach. Nice. Now, you mentioned when you guys were affiliated with the Yankees. And actually, mm -hmm. so you were here at the beginning when it was the Pirates. Right. And we were the Pirates in the first two years, 77 and 78. And then uh, that was with the John Galbraith family, who owned the Pirates at that time. And uh, he lived in Columbus and was very successful and helped us get started. We changed over to the Yankees in 79, and we were with them for the next 28 years. I always say I survived 28 years with the boss. <laughs> um, he was very good to us, and the Yankees were a wonderful affiliation. And as George started to get ill, and there started to be a movement in baseball to to get your major league team closer to your triple A team. Sure. And we started this to build Huntington Park. So uh, New York left because they had a chance to go to Scranton. And then we had two years we filled in with Washington. Okay, with the, the Nationals. Nationals. And um, while that was happening, Buffalo was still affiliated with the Cleveland Indians. And in 09, um, 
their affiliation was over so we were able to hook up with Cleveland and it's just been a wonderful experience and I think the fans really like it and you know we send the ballparks up and down you know, the players go up and down I-71 sure. so we could use one of those fast monorails between <laughs> Cleveland and Columbus these days. Nice. So, and you, you touched on it, and and I was going to ask, how has everything been with the Indians, and how? We'll, we'll kind of relate it to the Yankees because that was the longest. So, what would you say comparing the two? How have they been with the Indians? Well, they've both been great. The Indians are fabulous. Uh, love working with them. It's gonna. I grew up in Cleveland. Okay. So you know, I grew up hating the Yankees. So, <laughs> but it was kind of fun to have those resources with the Yankees. Sure. And and then see these special players come through. I mean, Derek Jeter, Mariano Rivera, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, Bernie Williams, and then towards the end, Robinson Cano. I mean, there was just so many great players that came through in those Yankee yeah. years. And then we kind of hit the void. And, you know, now that we've been with Cleveland, you've had Corey Kluber and Carlos Santana and Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez. And that list goes on and on, too. So uh, we've been very fortunate. And we've won in the tw- for our 12 years we've played with the Indians, not counting the, the pandemic year, we've won four Governor's Cup trophies. So we actually are the leader in the history of the International League. We've won the Governor's Cup 11 times nice. uh, since 1979. Uh, no other team has won it that many times. Rochester's won it 10 times, but their first time was back in 1939. So we did it in a lot shorter time. <laughs> Didn't unfair frame. advantage. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had better players. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you touch on it. I, I was going to talk about you guys. Uh, the, the Clippers are one of the most iconic and successful AAA teams ever. And so looking throughout your career, what was the most rewarding moment for you as general manager of the Clippers? You know, I don't know that there's such a thing as one moment. I mean, over, if there's a few. <laughs> over 45 years, you know, things kind of get lost. I sure. Mean, I'll always remember opening day of the old ballpark in 1977. Uh, it rained all day. We had AstroTurf. There was just so much pent-up interest. That we just went ahead and played in a light drizzle the whole day. And uh, not everything was ready. And... We were losing the game, and some of the fans were starting to grumble about not all the concession stands open and stuff. And then we rallied in the eighth inning, and we won the game, and not one complaint the next day. That was pretty cool. (laughs) You know, we hosted some all-star games that were there that were phenomenal, and, you know, it was a multi-purpose facility. So we hosted the Billy Graham Crusade for a week, which was just a phenomenal experience. And then we ended up with Garth Brooks for not one, not two, but six nights of concerts. Oh. Theater in the round set up on the AstroTurf. Awesome. And moving experience. Sure. And then, yeah, I remember our first Governor's Cup in 1979 uh, when we won. We had a great team. Uh, in the playoffs, we had a fan, still don't know their name, running around with one of those uh, big stuff Pink Panther dolls. <laughs> firing up the crowd and it was it was really amazing i mean the atmosphere was just fabulous and then the last game when we closed uh, cooper stadium in 2008 it was the 75th year of that facility um, we closed on a labor day we had 16,000 people we brought a lot of fans back uh it was really an emotional event at the end sure. and at the very end we gathered the staff on the pitching mound after everyone had left and all of us on the staff with me leading the way very slowly we did we did a lap around the field and then turned out the lights for the last time nice so that was cool the opening of this place in 2009 was a fabulous event uh, we had a parade with bob feller and some of the cleveland legendary uh, players that that came in to be part of that. Um, we've we've won four Governors Cups, as I said, with them in 12 years. Uh, we won national championships uh, back to back in 2010, 2011. Then we won in 15, and then also in 19. So um, you know we had some championship games that were really well. We we made some news back in 10 and 11. You know you get into the playoffs. And you've lost and back then because the major leagues could expand to 40 players. Okay. So we would lose a lot of our players. So, 
you know, we would count on the guys we had stepping up their game, and they'd bring a couple of people up from Double A that maybe would give us a charge. I mean, one sure. year it was Tyler Holt, young outfielder, okay. had some time with the Reds. The next year was a young guy by the name of Jason Kipnis, who uh, actually hit for the cycle in one of the playoff games. But you know, we got here schools in session, high school football, college football, the NFL, and we're in these playoff games and there weren't enough fans here and I could see read the body language in our dugout while I was up in the press box one night I said you know the heck with this this is playoff baseball it's not about the money it's about winning we're gonna let all the fans in free nice and we had them standing outside and I mean this place went from lukewarm no one's paying attention to suddenly the clippers in the playoffs were the biggest thing going on <laughs> in central ohio and i really believe that we won that year because the next night we started putting ten thousand fans in here sure. screaming for the players so <laughs> you know that's something whether it was smart or not it, it was it good and it worked <laughs> and uh We've been doing it ever since. Now, there's no playoffs this year, but that's become our treat to the fans. Support us all year long, and if we're in the playoffs, we're going to let you in free. That's, nice. our, that's our thank you back to you for all the times you came out during the regular season. Very cool. And then, then you've got fans for life. we got fans for life. Absolutely. And you kind of touched on it. We, we talked about all the successes. And as you mentioned, some seasons maybe don't go the way that you want this to. This is one of them. <laughs> so how do you – stay motivated in a season like that where maybe it's just not what you had hoped it would be well you start from the premise that we don't have any control over what's going on on the field sure Um, we've been lucky more often than not in having competitive teams you know you can't win every year you just you just want to be competitive i really believe that to some degree fans associate winning with having a good time right and in columbus you can see that i mean i've seen some days where the Buckeyes have lost a big football game that they weren't expected to and the flags come down to half mass and <laughs> dinner reservations are canceled. Good morning. And, yeah, and we go into immediate morning. So it's not quite as critical in baseball because we play so many games. Sure. But the end result is still be to still be competitive. And and even then it's about it's about presenting your product at Huntington Park engaging the fans making them feel a part of it you know making sure that this is wholesome affordable family entertainment night after night i've been telling the story a couple times this week at some speeches in 1977 our adult general admission price was five (laughs) dollars 45 years later it's gone all the way up to seven (laughs) dollars and our kids price 45 years ago was two dollars and that's going all the way up to five dollars now yeah I, I don't think we've kept up with inflation over right. those years <laughs> but it's certainly a, a good deal and sure you know that that is what motivates us to be affordable family wholesome entertainment get the families of central ohio out here give them something that they can enjoy be together for an evening you know baseball is the most affordable of the sports mm-hmm. and it's the one sport with 18 natural intermissions where fans even sit together with their families and you can talk between innings. You know, I always joke that when my kids were growing up and we'd take them you know, to the movies, they didn't want to see the same movie as mom and dad. And you took them to the mall, give us your credit card, we'll meet you in a couple of hours. <laughs> yep. And then you know, the cost was too much really to take them very often to, to, to football games sure. or, or big concerts or stuff. So. Base, baseball is truly a family event, and we take a lot of pride in making sure we're preserving that. Excellent. Now, if you could give a word of advice to a young man or young woman who thinks, you know, I, I'd be interested in sports management, maybe not particularly baseball, but we could, we could take that route. What's a word of advice that you would give them? Well, that, that field is changing all the time. Um, the onset of all this analytics mm-hmm. has maybe swung a little f- too far to the right or the left, depending on the whole money ball. <laughs> yeah, um, so there's certainly a there certainly has been room in the last couple of years for those kind of statistical geniuses to get involved in the game. Yeah, you one you have to do a sport that you love mm-hmm. because you have to get up every day. And, and the hours aren't even of a concern. If you're concerned about the hours and, 
and you don't look forward to being here 70 nights a year, then this is not for you. Right. Uh, you know, my advice is to learn as many different things as you can. Get a well-rounded college education while you're getting that degree in sports management. You know, no basic accounting. Know how to speak. I mean, you mm -hmm. have to be able to get up in front of two people or just you with a microphone right. or 500 people and be able to talk about the team with compassion, not just reading from notes and know what you're saying. You know, it helps to know languages. Sure. You know, about 30% of the players anymore are, are international. I wish I had learned Spanish. Um, I only took it in high school. My job was in high school was I, they had me sit next to the, the most important player on the football team, and I had to keep him eligible for high school games. So <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't pursue Spanish much after that. I wish I had. If I had to do it over again, I sure. would do that. So you've got to have a love for the game, whether it's golf, whether it's basketball, whether it's football, and then you need to get in the door any way you can. Now, I told some people in a master's class the other day, if you really want to be in a major league front office, you're better off trying to get into their mail room and work your way up than thinking you're going to come into minor league baseball and be a GM and naturally they're going to grab you for the for the big leagues. Right. You know, chances you have of going from this level to the big league level includes a severe step back in your responsibility and your duties learning things another way and sure. then trying to come up. And that's very difficult for people. Sure. You have to reprove yourself. You have to reprove yourself. Excellent. And Ken, before we end, I have one last question for you. Looking back over you're your... over your limit. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back over your career, if there's anything that you could change, what would it be? Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I mean, there's lots of little things sure. that you would change. Uh, I've never, I, I've always enjoyed coming to work. I've never been bored. Every day is different. Um, my, my job kind of is to put out fires and, and I try not to micromanage the staff. Uh, my goal is they all have jobs to do. They all have their own way of doing jobs. The important thing from my end is that we hit all the forks in the road together. So sure. the engine is the engine is running on all eight cylinders or however many we have out there. Um, no, no regrets, no no things I would do over again. I mean, you make a lot of mistakes, but that's part of learning. That's how you, I always exactly. say if if you don't make mistakes, then you're not trying. Right. So uh, you know, over the years, I've I've certainly made my share of them, and I still do. But it's just part of life and what we do. You just the game of baseball. Is like the game of life. Mm -hmm. It's individual people, their performance counts, but they're pulling together as a group and you know, they have a higher goal. You know, our goal is to present an outstanding product. The player's goal on the field is to win a game and get to the big leagues. So, um, and it's a thing that we both do every day. It's, it's a long season. Uh, you have areas where you're able to enjoy the thrill of your success i mean for the staff it's thanking people as fans are leaving the ballpark and him him having them thank you and just seeing the look of satisfaction on their face that they've had a pretty nice night really whether we won or lost now i'm not having such a good time if we lost but <laughs> but you know that's the thing the, the game of baseball mirrors the life of the american people more than any other sport sure and Ken, as we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to say to Clippers fans? No, I just, gosh, we'd be nowhere without them. I mean, we appreciate all of your support. Uh, you know, we had a lot of things that we all had to get through with the pandemic. Uh, it's still not over, but our fans have been tried and true for the 45 years, and we just try to keep living up to their expectations and making sure that that we treat them in the way that they would like to be treated. So that's our golden rule. Excellent. Well, Ken, thank you so much again for taking this time. We appreciate it. And as always, guys, we appreciate you spending this time. Uh, as I said earlier, if you're in Columbus, you owe it to yourself. Come down to Huntington Field. Take a look. This place is amazing. You'll have a blast. So as always, thank you so much. We love you guys. God bless and rock on.